In this episode, we talk about the first part of Hesiod's Theogony, in which he speaks of chaos and the muses, the origins of earth and sky, and the rise of night and its spirits. I'm Harley Combest, and this is Classics with Combest. Verily at the first, chaos came to be. But next, wide-bosomed earth, the ever-sure foundation of all the deathless ones, who hold the peaks of snowy Olympus, and dim Tartarus in the depths of the wide-pathed earth, and Eros, that is, love, fairest among the deathless gods, who unnerves the limbs and overcomes the mind, and wise counsels of all gods and all men within them. From chaos came forth Erebus, that is, darkness, and black night, but of night were born Aether, that is, the upper air which the gods breathe, and day, whom she conceived and bare, from union in love with Erebus. Theogony, 116 to 125. The beginning of Hesiod's universe was thus laid out, with chaos at the very origin of existence, followed swiftly by earth, Tartarus, Eros, Erebus, and night. One might say that this is quite an origin, and it's awfully quite silly when one comes to think of it, though it does carry a certain amount of awe to it. However, another must joyfully point out that a key feature of this text is that it doesn't begin with the beginning. No, no, no. It begins at the very end. That is to say, Hesiod's present time, circa 700 BC. It begins with Hesiod, whose name, by the way, means something along the lines of to throw songs or to speak odes. It begins with Hesiod, praising the muses for, for giving them his, this fascinating genealogy of the gods, giving them this, this scepter of sturdy laurel, and breathing into him a divine voice to speak of the things that, that were and will be. These are markers of great authority, and one might say even kingship, and might even lead credence to the idea, or might even be a hearkening to the idea, that the poets are the unacknowledged Legislatures, uh, legislators of the world, uh, an idea posited by Percy Shell in his defense of poetry. Concretely, more concretely, it, 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 it gives Hesiod a leg to stand on in his place in regards to speaking to his fellow Greeks on religious matters. You see, because back, back in ancient times, the conception of religion is actually quite different than it is now. Now, I guess you could say in modern terms, a, uh, if, if one were to see a, a person wearing a rosary at a synagogue, and if one weren't too timid and very curious, they might approach them and ask, hey, um, why are you wearing, <laughs> are you, well, they might ask that because, <laughs> goodness, but, but they, they, they'd likely ask, if, if you would likely ask, are you Catholic? Or are you Jew? Or are, what, like, what religion are you really? Um, if you weren't timid and were rather curious. Why that certain example? I don't know. It just happened to, to come up in my head. But anyhow, um, he, might, he, might however erroneously, uh, 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 he might however erroneously reply Catholic or Jew or Zoroastrian or whatever <laughs> in this case. But, uh, but anyways, you don't exactly have that happening in Grecian times, in, ancient, in the times of ancient Greece, because there wasn't a lot of theological roofing over the house of religious ideas. Uh, for instance, there would, the, you wouldn't see any sort of, uh, you wouldn't call different gods by different names if they belonged to different cultures. Rather, you'd say that they are, if, if they came from like Egyptian Thebes, if you, if you heard of like a sky god that came from Egyptian Thebes, you'd say, hey, um, that is Zeus, that, that, is, that is the Theban Zeus, the Egyptian Theban Zeus, Egyptian Zeus, something, something like that. You put the adjective of the, of the city, you put the uh, city in the adjective form before, the, before naming the specific god, and then you'd carry on. Um, because there wasn't a lot of theolog heavy theological distinctions in this time. Which leads us back to Hesiod. So, like Hesiod, he doesn't want to be 
another inch and an infinite mile, right? He is not, he is not as the muses put it, one of the mere bellies amongst his contemporaries. He's not a mere shepherd that works his days and only to get um, the, food, the, the, the food to nourish himself and, and be mindless and not have his own opinion on these matters. He's Hesiod, um, vessel of the muses, I guess you could say. And, um, and so he, he wants to be the voice which articulates the, the pieces of belief which, which make up what a modern reader would call religion into one solid object of traditional wisdom. And with the context given of what religion was, he wants to articulate vague reality with its many diverse cogs and, and wheels in its, in its intricate machinery into one concrete and understandable hierarchy uh, of, the, of, of the many parts which compose it. This being the case then, what is chaos? What are the things that one can't deny in living with it and being? By subjecting it to the microscope of human experience, of suffering, one can see that it is indeed made up of the ground which we're stuck to, the depths, the pits which we fear, the, the desires which act upon us, the darkness which creates the lost and is the unseen, and the night which brings the day. Thus, from chaos, we begin to order. And earth first bare, starry heaven, equal to herself, to cover her on every side, and to be an ever sure abiding place for the blessed gods. And she brought forth long hills, graceful haunts of the goddess nymphs, who dwell amongst the glens of the hills. She bare also the fruitless deep, with his raging swell, Pontus, without sweet union of love. Theogony, 125 to 134. Then, with the help of the sky, the earth bears the living ocean with the rest of the titans, including the youngest, Kronos, who's mentioned as being particularly wily and hating of his father, along with the three Cyclops. Cyclops, which, by the way, means orb guide. Um, and three Hecaton carries. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. doesn't really matter. It means hundred-handers. Now, this is all well and good, one might say, but where's the ordering? This seems to make more of a mess of things than, than, uh, than clarity, than bringing clarity or lucidity. What's one to make of that? And why is Kronos so wily? <laughs> and that's sort of an understatement, as we'll come to see here in a moment. It certainly is hard to say for a lot of it, but one can make out the hidden, savory morsel of wisdom which these notions may contain by breaking them up and examining them separately, by ordering, uh, by ordering clarity out from vague chaos, if you will. The earth-making sky, who is specifically mentioned as being e an equal to herself, is a hearkening to the idea that once, that, that once all that you see around you is all that could have ever been, and now the sky is the limit. That sounds rather corny. Admittedly, that sounds rather corny. Uh, but it does have a bit of sway behind it once we seek to know man's relation to the sky. After all, he does seem to be fascinating. He does seem to be rather fascinated with it from the start. There's um, like going back to ancient times. One sees that Uranus was a was a god throughout all populaces everywhere, though by different names. Like uh, for instance, among the ancient Hindus, there there was Dias, Dias Pisa. By the way, the pronunciation of all of these things is going to be rather flawed. <laughs> but uh, there was Dias Pita, Sky Father. In ancient Egypt, um, whose name means sky father, in ancient Egypt it was common. It was a common belief that Newt, the Egyptian sky goddess, as is common in hieroglyphic depictions, was supported uh, above a reclining earth, Geb, by Shu, Air, He, infinite, infinity and flood and hot, feminine of He. In ancient China, there's a particular sky emperor, Shangdi, that comes to mind. In early biblical texts, there is a per persistent idea of God speaking from the heavens um, through, through several different events, uh, a hearkening back to early Judaic roots of belief, which tend to be more polytheistic. Even before one sees the rise of somewhat organized religion, there's a convincing argument to be made that some Paleolithic cave paintings were, at heart, depictions of constellations. One can always chalk this up to being a mere fascination of small caveman, you know, like a Neanderthal, that sort of depiction, dumb caveman, 
in, in, a, in a big world with pretty lights in the sky. But there's something more to that. And uh, I, I think uh, another, another thing that might be quite interesting in, in, regards to, in regards to talking about it just being mere fascination are, are the, the fact that they, could, they, they put such detail into their, into, their, um, into their work. And not only that, but when, it, when man began to walk upright roughly six to three million years ago, there are signs that there was an active galactic nucleus jet activity being emitted from a massive black hole in our galaxy that would have appeared to be a light source as big as the moon to anyone living below 20 degrees latitude of the equator, which was pretty much everyone back then according to most, uh, most studies. However, even if it were a mere fascination, why be fascinated? Like, I, I oftentimes see, like, these mythology podcasts and whatnot, and just, like, stories of mythology and everything. They, they talk about the stories and everything, and they say, oh, it's rather interesting. Or they t they'll talk about history, and it's like, oh, it's, it's rather interesting. But it's like, why is it interesting? And it's like, well, it gets to the heart of the human experience. And, what I, and, and without going into further speculation, which, which going back into the, into the past necessitates, all of this is to say that conscious man seems always to have looked to the sky despite being a creature stuck to the earth. And he never stopped, from cave paintings to moon landings. To look to the sky, then, is to acknowledge that one is more than just their earthly being. To look at the sky is to acknowledge that there is a you to see the sky, to see the change, to see the upper beyond, a heaven as bright and high as, as Tartarus, the pit is dark and low. To see time and space, to see all that lies upward to which you partake in by sight, by acknowledging that it's there, because it is. Looking at the sky in this way allows the birth of the titans, like a, because earth and sky give, give birth to the titans, which is actually uh, quite telling, because it allows a, a clarification of this rather than, to, 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 rather than cluttering what we have in mind. For earth and sky bring forth Okinos, which is, um, river ocean, a sea springing with life, which is different from Pontus, who was described in the lines I read earlier, because it's, it's closer to, to what, 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 man, what man relates to, because, uh, or has experience with it, with, rather, because it's no longer just still, it's no longer just salt water, it's, uh, it's, it's the ocean, it's, um, it, ha it has things teeming with life, it has things to interact with, possibly, getting into adventures and, and whatnot. And then we have Koyas, who's often associated with inquisitive intellect. Kreos, whose name means something along the lines of Ram, uh, which is a constellation which marked the beginning of a new year back then. And Hyperion, whose name means he who goes above and is often associated with light. Iapetus being representative of the mortal lifespan. And what's pretty funny about that is he's often, well, funny and rather interesting, uh, for the given reason which I mentioned uh, sparks interest from the very beginning, is that he's associated with craftsmanship. Uh, the mortal lifespan being associated with craftsmanship. You're going to die, so you better build something. <laughs> something like that. And you have uh, Thea, who's associated with sight and prophecy. Um, Rhea, who's associated with motherhood. Themis, divine law. Menesene, memory. Phoebe, predicting intellect. Tethys, fresh water. And Kronos who's often associated with agricultural, agricultural tendencies. And um, in the Orphic Theogenies, which come a bit later, he's associated with time. Though some people like to separate Kronos uh, from that, that, the representative of time from, from, the, from the Titan. But I think there's a strong case to be made that a lot of them believe that they were one and the same. And for good reason, because it's like, it's like the, the whole agriculture thing. It's like distincting, like making a distinction in between that and time um, from a very primal stage of existence is a, it's a, it's not something that that's really obvious. It's like the thing which nourishes consciousness um, from the very beginning. It's like a that's that that's pretty close to something approximating time, nearly. Um, not not a, not like a, a definitive claim, but it's certainly something that one could see. And from that, like one can justly see that. Out of like out of all of those examples of the of the of the names and and what the uh, of the titans and what they're associated with, one can justly claim that it's out of looking at the sky that one that man comes to grips with the idea of the transcendent, which is an idea that which will be, become tantamount. Um, it becomes tantamount to being a, a core of of Western canon. 
it's, it's from the realization of the above and the beyond that we put forth the effort to look at the sea as more than just subtle matter in a, in a sort of reflection and in looking at ourselves. It's from the realization that, that uh, of the above and beyond that we come to put forth the idea that, that, the, that, there's, that there's more to the world than just the matter. We begin to question the world around us, mark the passing of time, acknowledge that the aim is towards the light, realize our own mortality, develop new ideas to cope with it, see the moral consequences of action that lie outside of our power to change, can remember all of this to begin with, and mark our place in the rapid current of time. Okay, okay, okay. But what about night? Why is that a separate element of sky? Isn't night, isn't, isn't, and why is it a separate element from, from darkness? Isn't, isn't night defined by change in the sky? More like, namely by darkness? Why, why make it have its own distinction? It makes sense for darkness to be distinguished. One can go into the nearest cave and realize it doesn't take the sky for darkness to exist on both the literal and moral planes of perception. A 2013 study from the Journal of Environmental Psychology found that experiencing darkness leads individuals to have less of a care for moral considerations. They're more likely to, to lie, to cheat, to steal, to, um, well, all of those things, and, and possibly to get to more, the more heinous acts like murder and whatnot. Uh, <laughs> but we won't really have to go into that until, well, Kronos, Kronos that wily, wily individual who really hates his father, will really get into <laughs> a bit of that. But, um, Another study, this one from 1995, found that in a medical center in Anchorage, Alaska, in over a five-year period, over half of all nurse medication errors were made in the first three months of the year. Now, I understand this could be very well like, a, like just um, ill-speaking of medical centers in Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, if that's the case, then sorry for those of you listening that, <laughs> that live in Anchorage, Alaska. But other than that... It could, it could very well be something that's a bit more, uh, a bit less superficial. It could be de demonstrable uh, of, a, of a more wider, uh, a more wider uh, analysis that, that human errors tend to, go to, tend to go up as darkness increases. It, like human errors increase as darkness increases. The darkest amounts of the, of the year produce the largest amount of, of human error. So, which is, which is, which is rather interesting because it's like as darkness, darkness increases, so does human error, which makes sense if we're dealing with like seeing things. But other than that, um, because we assume these places are well lit in order to see where, where, you're, where you're sticking the needles in everybody to begin with, it would be horrendous if they weren't, if you were operating by candlelight, which uh, could be the case in some, <laughs> some less, developed, uh, less developed parts of the world. But anyways, um, it's it's uh, demonstrable of a broader trend that as darkness increases, so does human error. Um, and founding, like a confounding er variables being considered. And furthermore, according to a 2004 study from the Journal of Neuro-Ophthalmology, long periods of not seeing light when blindfolded, um, it's quite possible that one will experience visual hallucinations ranging from simple, like bright spots of light, to complex, like faces, landscapes, ornate objects. Um, however, like all of this sort of poses the question and of uh, is this solely attributable to, attributable to um, darkness or are these effects originating from the night? Like this seems like a rather trying conundrum on the surface, but it's interesting and clarifying when examined from a perspective that considers evolutionary phenomenon. A 2015 study in the International Journal of Psychophysiology asked the question of whether night or darkness intensifies a feeling of fear. They sought to answer it by having 120 women put into a windowless cubicle and perform the task of looking at neutral pictures like nature scenes. So like, a, like if, if you've ever seen like a nature, a, a nature documentary with, with Morgan Freeman, um, not specifically Morgan Freeman, but just for this specific example of, uh, of getting getting to your memory, um, if you've ever seen like a nature docu documentary with like Morgan Freeman um, doing a voiceover of it, uh, of it. So like nature scenes like that. Um, so they, they had them look at that and they had them look at scary pictures 
like those depicting violence. Um, and they had them listen to neutral sounds, like nature sounds, birds chirping, crickets, uh, crickets chirping, uh, like, like th those sorts of noises. And they had them listen to scary sounds, like screams of terror. Um, and a fourth of them did this during the day with the lights on. A fourth of them did this, did this same task during the day in complete darkness. A fourth of them did this at nighttime with the lights on. And a fourth of them did this at night in complete darkness. Now what they discovered um, came, off, came off as a rather, rather uh, surprising because they found that regardless of the lighting, the night groups found these stimuli, the pictures and sounds more fearful. This was confirmed at the, as, at, at the physiological level when it was noticed that, that their heart rates and levels of perspiration were actually higher than the other two groups. These results show that one is more likely to give in to fear responses when it's night because it's night rather than because of the darkness which permeates it. This means that it's quite likely that the, uh, that the results, tendencies, tendencies to care less about moral considerations, making more mistakes, hallucinating from, from, from the other experience, experiments mentioned, er, mentioned earlier, likely have night at their core rather than just darkness. Why is this happening? Well, it comes back to a process which my sleep-deprived audience is likely to know. The circadian rhythm. It's basically the natural process which our bodies go through to regulate the sleep-wake cycle. There's a lot more that goes into it involving melatonin and cortisol, but the basic grounds of what it is, uh, of what it is constitute a fine, a fine level of comprehension for the, for, the, um, for the purpose of this discussion. The point is that the brain is preparing for night when, when night comes. And night used to be a very terrifying thing. And, and like, like for, for sleeping out there in the environment, picture, picture camping, wearing nothing but a, but a, but a, but a picture camping, except not having a tent and wearing nothing but a loincloth out there with the bare wilderness. It's like a, you're, you're golem, but with no motivation whatsoever, and you're, you're scrawny and weak and pathetic in comparison to everything else that exists out there. And, uh, <laughs> and go, right? <laughs> it's just like, um, and so it's sort of, it's sort of, it's a, it's a bit dramatic. <laughs> um, but, but it illustrates, it, it illustrates my point, and, and the brain is prepped for it. Like the parts, uh, the parts of the brain which regulate emotion are far older than the parts which allow one to reason. And one can hardly think of a stronger emotion than fear, like the, the in the case of like a, so like the amygdala, uh, the amygdala, which, uh, which sort of uh, roughly stated governs fear responses and whatnot, like that, that sort of side of, of, of behavior is far older than the prefrontal cortex, which roughly stated um, uh, manages reason, re reasoning capacity. Um, so this mechanism, it, it may not be the best when, when working with like complex, with, uh, with more complex social relations and uh, morality, but the alertness, the alertness which it gives is certainly very useful for, for basic survival. Um, but it leaves us uh, with the fact that we're more likely to act rashly, being more under the sway of fear at night than in most instances. So you're more likely to act rashly, more likely to make mistakes, uh, lapses of judgment, that sort of thing. But what does Hesiod really have to say about all of this? He basically agrees. Uh, he says that night gave birth to hateful destiny, black, black fate, death, sleep, the tribe of dreams, care, full of woes, Hesperides, which sort of like uh, goes against my argument, unless if there's some further analysis which is needed to be, which needs to be done on that. Nymphs of the Golden Apples Beyond, th those are the Nymphs of the Apples Beyond uh, Oceanus, um, uh, who you all may be familiar with. And then he goes on to say destinies, the fates, nemesis, which sometimes people say is just revenge, but it's more like divine retribution. It's more like, oh wow, like we, we all saw that coming sort of thing. It's like, a, uh, like <laughs> yeah, like, like that sort of thing. Like if you... <clears throat> And then there's like a, I won't sort of get further into that, but, but then there's like fraud, wanton love, old age, and heiress, who represents human discord. To make the point more explicit, 
he says that the night brings a lot. So basically, Hesiod says that the night brings a lot of human badness. That, that's basically the point right there. Hesiod makes Eris the embodiment of discord. Okay, so discord in, in this sense is a lot different from chaos um, because because uh, it's it's representative of all of the like like the the heart of evil is basically human. It's basically the the point that which is kind of made there. Um, but but it's more so like um, all of the all of the the bad things that that people have to deal with that come from people. It's like uh, that's basically what Eris sort of represents, and she um, and she gives birth on her own to trouble, oblivion, famine. Uh, wait 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 goodness, uh, trouble, oblivion, famine, tearful woes, contests and slaughters, fights, homicides, quarreling, falsehoods, words, disputes, lawless. Lawlessness, ruinous mischief, and last but certainly not least, the oath, which Hesiod says is hurts most men on earth, especially those that perjure, those that go back on their word. Now, this may not demonstrate that he knew particularly about the fear factor that goes into it, but he wasn't stupid, right? He recognized the effects that night had on his fellow man, and for that, I, I, I'd have to say that he's a, he's a bit more in depth than a lot of people give him credit for. And with that, this has been Classics with Combest.